Um, and this was like before ICO and everything, right? So it was, was Danny's company. Um, and we recently just announced that uh, we're also leading their Medigrid round, which was uh, a five million raise. So it's, it's, it's somewhat emotional, but also at the same time, I just feel very grateful that we have the opportunity to kind of like talk and share like the future of Bitcoin here. Thank so you, let me start off by asking uh, a more general question, which is obviously um, Casey is now one of the most influential you know, individual in the crypto space and they call them the, the Bitcoin artists, right? So, and you're doing something, you know, with, with, with digital art, digital artifacts as well, right? So how are they re relevant? Um, what, what does it have to do with crypto? Yeah, and, you know, Casey gave a great talk earlier and, and also Brian Armstrong, you know, talking about, you know, uh, sci-fi. So, I mean, art and science, they're, they're all actually very related. You know, it's about creativity. It's about uh, telling stories and understanding the world. It's about thinking, right? Thinking deeply about the world. And so, so art is, I mean, with, with Ornos and, and, and art on Bitcoin, it's actually, uh, it, it, it was very, very, um, very, when, when I saw it, it was very meaningful for me to, to come back to working on Bitcoin. Because I, I got into crypto because of Bitcoin. And it's always, you know, Bitcoin is that very special thing. But, but, but on, art, on art side, you know, art actually is uh, very, like art can be very forward thinking and like Bitcoin didn't exist 15 years ago. And this idea of this, you know, decentralized currency of, or this thing that you can own, right? It's, it's something that is, it's, it's a digital thing that you can own and transact. It's, it's actually very foreign for, for pretty much everyone in the world because it didn't exist 15 years ago. But if you look at art, <clears throat> so let me talk about one artist and his art. So there's, a, there's an artist named uh, Eve, Eves Klein, and he had this art back about 70 years ago where, so he's known for conceptual art, and he, he painted, he has these paintings of just blue, like this, the, the, the painting is just a, a solid blue color, and he actually patented that blue color, um, calling it, uh, you know, Klein's International Blue. And so he had this exhibit uh, in the 50s in Paris where the, this exhibit he prepared this gallery where he just painted the whole gallery white, just just white, and and he opened it up, and you know thousands of people went to see you know his work because he's he's a famous artist, and people went in, and they just saw an empty gallery painted white, and you know some people came out a little bit puzzled, but actually the reception was good. People liked this art. The art critics loved it, and so what what Eve Klein was was trying to portray in his art was that. He was actually, it was the essence of the blue that was in the, the gallery or in the, in the exhibit. The essence was created from nothing, or rather, he wanted to create the art from as little material as possible. And in this case, it was no material. He didn't need any material to make it, but the essence was there. That was the point of this art. And people who went through the exhibit, they experienced the essence of that art. That, that art was called the um, zones of uh, immaterial pictorial sensibilities. So people who, the collectors who went through it, they, they, they got the sensibility of that art. And you know, after they, uh, some of these collectors went through this exhibit, they actually asked artists, how do I buy the art? Right, how do you buy this thing that doesn't exist, right? And, and this artist, he had, he had a process for this. So, he, he told the collectors, this is how you buy my art. This is how you buy zones, right? That's, that's the art, name of the art. He said, come with me to the riverbank. Come meet me at this riverbank. Bring this much gold. Exactly this much, bring gold. I, I only accept gold, you know, to buy this art. No other currency, right? Bring gold, meet me at this riverbank. And then, you know, and then this, hap this happened several times. So the collector meets him, meets Klein at the riverbank and brings the gold gives the gold to Klein. Klein then writes a receipt and says, you, you bought my work, Here, here's a receipt. And the point he was trying to make, so, so what, what just happened here, right? So what happened was Klein gave the collector a, a receipt of the work. So it's a legal document saying, now you own the work. But it's actually not the work, right? But the work is actually immaterial. I mean, it, it's, the work doesn't have any material, right? It's, it, it's, it's kind of this phantom thing. So, 
how does he actually own the work, right? He owns the legal document that says he owns the work. So the, this ritual of, of buying the work has, is, isn't done yet. The, cli the, the client tells the client, well, if you actually want to own the physical work, as opposed to just the certificate of the work, what you have to do now is you have to burn the certificate, burn the receipt that you just got. If you burn the receipt, then you actually embody this immaterial work and you actually physically own it. And what that means is for the collector, they've destroyed the, the receipt that proves they own the work. That receipt is a thing that they can actually sell, right? If they want to sell this work again, they need that receipt to sell it because they can't sell the thing after they burned it. And so actually several collectors went through this process. They, they burned the receipt after they paid for it in gold. And it wasn't done yet. The clients, uh, after the receipt was burned, Klein took half of the gold and he threw it in the river. So the, the, the artist also you know, burned some, some of that. So that, that was the, the ritual, that, that was kind of the completion of the art. So the exploration here, so, so we're talking about kind of Bitcoin and immaterial things, right? So the exploration here in this art back from you know, seven years ago was, well, you know, what's material and what's immaterial? And how do you own something, right? Whether it's material or immaterial. And then how do you transfer that ownership? Right? And that's really what Bitcoin is about, too. You know, Bitcoin is this immaterial thing, uh, but you can own it you know, with this blockchain, with this ledger, with these UTXOs, and you can transfer it you know, in, in this process of these Bitcoin transactions that you know, use UTXOs from inputs to outputs. So you know, I think looking at art, you can actually learn a lot if you really you know, think deeply about it. And it, you, could, you can even say Bitcoin is kind of uh, like art. It's like a you know, perform or, you know, conceptual art of, of ownership of digital goods, and you know, all of us here are participating you know, in, in that art. Interesting. So, you know, obviously there is all these chains out there. Uh, you, you've only specifically mentioned about Bitcoin. Uh, what's wrong with Solana, uh, Ethereum, and the existing NFT market in, 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 these, in these chains? Yeah, so actually there's nothing wrong with, with, with um, those chains. Um, NFTs, so, so the fungible token and Bitcoin came first, right? It's been almost 15 years of, of that. And people are starting to understand, you know, Bitcoin. In fact, the Bitcoin maxis feel like they, they totally understand Bitcoin. And they, they don't think there's a thing as NFTs, right? They think you, you can't own NFTs. It's just JPEGs. Right click say, right? Doesn't exist. Um, but NFTs have been around a, a couple of years now. Um, they've mainly uh, developed on, I mean, they were on Bitcoin too in the earlier days. But kind of the, the real growth of NFTs happened in the last couple of years on Ethereum. And that was after the Ethereum ERC721 or the Ethereum um, protocol for, for NFTs uh, kind of was established. And, and that, that was around 2018. So th that, that protocol is around basically kind of also actually a certificate model. It's a certificate model or uh, you, you have a certificate and it's tradable on chain. So it's kind of this ownership is about owning the certificate and you can trade it on chain to something that points off chain. And in fact, one of the important early NFTs that happened before the ERC721 token was also actually an art piece by an artist. Uh, so there's an artist named Mitchell F. Chan, who actually, uh, he, he, was, he got into crypto early, and he saw crypto, uh, and he also knew about Eve, um, Eve Klein's work from the 50s. And he thought, well, actually, that work is very inspirational, where I can actually make an NFT of that exact work, of the zones work. So he actually, so this star is Mitchell F. Chan, made digital zones, the digital version of you know, the, the zones work from the 50s using Ethereum. This was before the ERC721 standard. So he used ERC20s to make this, this work. So in this art, it was a, it was actually the art itself was a blank screen. You, uh, so, so when, when the art was available, you could go to a website and then you could open that art and it was just a blank screen, uh, you know, all, Basically, it was kind of immaterial. I mean, the, the art was called Digital Zones of you know, immaterial, immaterial Pictorial Sensibilities. So it's the digital version of Klein's work, but, but using crypto now. So, so you see this next screen. Uh, and then if you want to buy this art, then what you could do is you go, go to, and this is, this is pre like a, a lot of the NFT tooling. You go to, and, and this is also on purpose by, by the artist. You had to go to Etherscan, and you could then mint the receipt of, the, the image that was not an image, 
right? So there was, this is basically an NFT that had no image, but you could get a receipt of that no image. Um, and, and then there was also the ritual where, so you, sure, you can buy the receipt, and so you, now you own the, basically the legal document of the art, but you don't actually own the art. So his point, the, the artist's point was, just like in the original one, uh, if you actually want to own and embody the, the art that was immaterial, you had to then burn your receipt, right? So, so, there, so um, Mitchell actually made 101 of these receipts available to mint. They, they were first minted uh, in 2017. My friend actually minted the first two uh, back right when 2017, right when they were available. And uh, this was actually a small group of, you could say, kind of art, a combination of art lovers and also maybe some really you know, nerdy crypto people. So my friend, um, you know, in the first two, and he actually burned the second one. He minted two because he actually wanted to burn one to really experience the art, and then keep one to have the receipt in case you know it was worth something in the future. So that's what he did back right when it happened. Uh, then he forgot about it. So then you fast forward actually a couple of years till th this work didn't mint out for four years. It took four years to mint a hundred and or to sell a hundred and one of uh, the, the, uh, these receipts. Like, you know, they no, no one actually wanted to buy them. It's, it's pretty funny. So all the way until 2021, they finally all sold out, 101 of them. Uh, and then the NFT kind of, uh, you could say, craze or bull run happened, you know, on Ethereum first. You know, you know CryptoPunks and, and Bored Apes, they, they got a lot of, you know, value. So the zones, actually, people looked back and said, hey, these digital zones, it's actually a very meaningful, you know, piece of art, right? Telling the story of, you know, basically crypto, of owning these immature things where you can, whether, how you can own them, how you can transfer them. And so people really appreciate that art in 2021. I don't know how many people have heard of it here, but it actually was auctioned on, so one of those was auctioned on Sotheby's uh, for 1.2 million just for a single receipt from, you know, something that couldn't mint out for four years. And, you know, that is, so, so that's kind of just one example of um, kind of the, the power of NFTs. But the question about, you know, well, why Bitcoin now versus Ethereum or Solana? I mean, Ethereum and Solana are actually great for NFTs. The growth of basically this model of, of you know, certificate ERC721 made NFTs. And you guys started from Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. We, and we actually started in Ethereum too. So this is actually a great model. It's actually, um, so one thing I, I would disagree with uh, Casey on is actually a lot of people uh, st still want to use, and communities are very sticky. You know, a lot of people will stick with both Ethereum and Solana, you know, for things like, like uh, you know, ERC721, for NFTs. These are actually, you know, very interesting things that are being built there. Um, and we started there too with on-chain we, we launched on Ethereum. Uh, it was an on-chain collection though, so it wasn't using the certificate model where you point to, let's say, IPFS or something else. We want to actually make it basically lasting, right? Something that uh, is very, the, the concept of ownership is you actually own the thing on chain versus you own the receipt on chain, right? Those are the two different concepts of ownerships for NFTs that are very, very, you know, uh, different. Um, and because we did it this way, when we saw that Ornos um, was actually pretty much designed as a, a NFT protocol for on chain assets, not the certificate model, it made a lot of sense for us to move over because, you know, this is a type that is great for something that's lasting. And also Bitcoin is the chain that also is going to be, I'd say, if you, if you want to look at things 100 years out, it has a much higher chance of being around than, you know, other chains. Got it. And, and going to my next question, which is very relevant to, which is as a project, I think there is a lot of options, like in terms of like which chain you want to move to, right? Um, and historically, when we invest in project, what we realize is, if you build on a, if you, know, if you build a project on Solana, you not only get funding from VC, you also get majority funding from Solana Foundation and from their venture arm. But Bitcoin doesn't have that. In fact, Bitcoin is basically at one point the opposite of that, right? There were maxis who had a lot of resistance against Ornos and moving asset over. So. What's John? What's your thought on that? Like, why and is that going to be an issue in terms of getting more asset on? And what's it going to be like for the future of you know people who want to move more asset on Bitcoin? Yeah, well, I, I think you know Bitcoin is the highest value you know blockchain. So there actually is a lot of capital in, in, in Bitcoin, and 
people have you know big bags. Like they, a lot of people have a lot of stake in Bitcoin. So there are many people who want to see Bitcoin being used. I think one of the problems that Bitcoin had the last couple of years was no one was actually using Bitcoin, the chain, right? Basically, you had holders who, you know, storing Bitcoin in there is a kind of a use case, but you're not actually using it in a way that makes, you know, Bitcoin secure because, you know, miners have to receive, you know, fees for that. So now, now we have, you know, people actually using Bitcoin. Um, but going back to mo us moving to, from Ethereum to Bitcoin, so we, we actually also use a feature of Ordinals that's actually really interesting, right? The idea of the Teleburn is a really interesting feature of, of you know, big, you know, ordinal inscriptions. And so a Teleburn is the idea that an inscription has an Ethereum address that you can derive that then you can send something from, you know, Ethereum, some asset from Ethereum, any asset, you know, basically to your, your um, Bitcoin inscription. And, but that address or that account on Ethereum that you send it to, because it's derived, no one has a public key for that. So you're basically you know, burning it or locking it. Or you could say you're so bounding it to something on, on Bitcoin. Uh, but you are preventing yourself from being able to trade on, on Ethereum. So actually, that was one of the things that we explored when we did basically our, you know, our art on Bitcoin. You know, we care about kind of the long-term legacy, but also we are exploring this idea of, of ownership. You know, what is ownership of a digital good? And in this case, you know, we, we had a collection on Ethereum. It's already kind of an on-chain digital artifact collection. On, on Bitcoin, we actually created a certificate. So it's a nice looking certificate. And each one is unique and points to the specific Ethereum asset that you teleburned. And so the idea here is actually similar to the, the two art um, projects I mentioned earlier. So if you burn your Ethereum asset, you no longer control it there. So do you actually own it still or not? But you own the certificate on Bitcoin, which is saying you own the thing. So, so, you, so you're basically transferring basically ownership of something you, you previously owned the whole thing of to you own a certificate of. And that certificate says you own the thing on Ethereum. Uh, this actually is, I think, something important for Bitcoin in the future because certificates still are important. In this case, we made a certificate that is a digital artifact on Bitcoin using Ornos. And Ornos is really about digital artifacts. But the certificate model is still important because what we did was we, we made something that's basically kind of a, a title to some other thing, right? Some other asset. And that's actually one of the promises that many people want to do with Bitcoin for many years, which is, you know, use Bitcoin to secure and trade, you know, other assets, either virtual or real. A like real world asset is, is a big deal. You know, land titles, all these things can be done with Bitcoin. So my understanding is the company not only committed I think you guys spent like a million USD just to do this, right? The Teleburn. Oh, yeah. So also the, the other thing about Orno's, Orno inscriptions, right? As people use Bitcoin, um, we know the fees are going up. They've gone up a lot, right? The fees today are much higher than they were a year ago. And, and actually just using inscriptions, it's expensive, right? Any inscription, you know, you really have to care about the thing you're, you're making. You believe, have to believe that thing, you know, there's legacy there, there's meaningful, lasting value. And, and I can definitely see that because the raise that you guys did right now is basically going towards the new platform called Osura, right? Um, so the question I guess a lot of people will have is like, well, there's already exchanges that support, you know, Bitcoin, like Magic Eden, right? So what's the difference between, can you share more, but a bit more about Asura? What's the difference between Asura and like Magic Eden, for example? Yeah, so it, it is, it's a new market. NFTs on Bitcoin is pretty new. Uh, we're focused on art first because, you know, art, uh, people understand art and, 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 you know, art, as I said earlier, it can be very meaningful. And it is now, Bitcoin is a medium that you can make art on. And this protocol is very, uh, it, it's really, it has turned Bitcoin into the, it's actually a pretty amazing medium for art. And artists want, you know, their art to be on a very long lasting, uh, you know, platform, which Bitcoin is. So our focus is on art. Um, you know, Magic Eden is actually, used for non-fungible or NFTs on Bitcoin, you know, they're the leader right now. Uh, but, you know, it's still a very early market. There's a lot of different types of NFTs, which is also the very interesting, th interesting thing about Ornos. You, you can have things like bitmaps and PRC20s. And, you know, th these are all, in, in a sense, they're actually like, um, they're, they're, they are like the certificate model I mentioned earlier, like a bitmap actually, isn't um, 
the, the thing itself is just text, but it referred to something else that, that's more meaningful. And so you can do all these different types of NFTs on Bitcoin. And you know, Magic Eden uh, basically focus on, pretty much, or they don't focus on a specific one, they, they cover everything. For us, we're focused on art and you know, kind of uh, high value assets. I, I know you guys have some crazy announcement coming up on, on art. Is this something you can share, or at this point, it's too sensitive? <laughs> you, can, you can say no. You can say no, right. but. No. OK, that's fine. Uh, guys, uh, Danny uh, from Onchain Monkey, MetaGood, stay tuned. There's updates coming up, but right now, no. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot, Danny. Thank you.